Sana, thank you so much for your beautiful, beautiful words. Um, at this time, please join me in welcoming uh, a great friend of high tech, a former member of the high tech board of directors, uh, a member for many years of the high tech 100, and now a member of the high tech hall of fame. Uh, Tim, it's great to have you back at high tech. Please welcome CIO for Apple, Tim Campos. Welcome, welcome. Tim, you missed the high-tech check-in earlier this morning, so I'm gonna ask you to check in, but I also realized that I forgot to do a check-in, and I wanna correct it because, I wanna, I wanna say it because I don't know that we heard from anybody from my home country of Guatemala, uh, and so I will do it. My name is Omar Duque, as, as you all know. Uh, I am the president of high-tech. I am the proud, I was born in Chicago, and I am the proud son of once undocumented immigrants from Guatemala. Uh, and I am uh, incredibly blessed to be here with, with all of you today. Uh, Tim, I'll, I'll uh, invite you to do your check-in. Well, hello everybody, it's good to be back here. Uh, my name is Timothy Enrique Campos. <laughs> uh, I am the proud son of uh, uh, Joseph Campos, my father, uh, who uh, was born and raised in the Dominican Republic uh, and is just a big part of, of who I am. Love it. So we're going to go ahead and just jump into the questions. All right. Um, you've had a unique career journey with experiences working both for large and established companies like Facebook, where you were the CIO, now Apple. Uh, you built your own startup, Woven. Uh, from zero to exit, and I was sad when, uh, when, when that went the way of Slack because <laughs> Me <too>. I used it, <laughs> Me too. and I thought it was a great tool. Um, how did those experience, experiences help you in your approach uh, in this new role as CIO of Apple? Yeah, so you know, I, when I started my career, I was an engineer. That's, that's how I, I began everything. And even before that, um, you know, as, a, as a kid, I just liked to take stuff apart. And uh, I became an engineer in part because my father would get so pissed off at me, excuse me if I'm getting too, a little too offensive with my language, he would get so angry because uh, he'd come home and these prized possessions would be in pieces. So he was like, I expect you to put this stuff back together. And uh, it wasn't so nice in his language. The, um, so that built just a lifelong passion for building things. And uh, so when I got into my professional career, you know, software engineering was something I was really interested in and excited about, and I figured that's what I would, uh, I would just keep going. Um, but along the way, I realized that as you're building a product, like there's this whole businessy stuff. Like there's all these people who are responsible for working with customers, and they come in and they have all these interesting requirements. And so I wanted to learn a lot more about business to better understand where this stuff was coming from. And uh, so I spent a lot of time working in the business. That's actually why I got into IT. I saw IT as a technical function, uh, just like engineering, but it was more of, had a more of a business uh, uh, thesis. It, you know, IT exists to use technology to achieve a business outcome. And so uh, I became a real student of business, so much so that eventually I went back to business school to formalize that, a transformative experience for me that uh, really helped me change how I see the world. The thing that I didn't realize was missing was the entrepreneurial journey. Um, so, you know, I did very well uh, in my professional universe, but I, working in Silicon Valley, working with all these startups, I always wanted to understand what was it like to create something from scratch, not just a product, but really the company. And so uh, that's what I left Facebook to do, is to go build uh, Woven, this uh, crazy startup idea. And the thing that I learned the most as an entrepreneur, first off, how hard it is. Uh, and second off, how you, know, you have to be responsible for everything. You know, at a, when you work at a bigger company, it's easy to take stuff for granted, not just the, you know, the, the benefits and the building and all that kind of stuff. It's, it's, uh, it's also that you know, when you build that product, there's already a marketing organization. There's already a sales organization. There's already all these other people that will help you create this business. But when you're the entrepreneur, nothing gets done that you don't figure out how to make happen. And um, 
that really changed how I think about things. I stopped taking for granted different functions. And uh, now that I um, have had the opportunity to go figure out what I want to do next, and I've gotten this incredible opportunity to work at a company like Apple, uh, it's really bringing all that stuff uh, together. It's my understanding of technology, my understanding of business. I'm usually the most, uh, the most business-oriented technical person in the room. That doesn't make me the smartest technologist in the room. There's lots of other s smarter people than me in the universe on technology, but I'm usually the most business-oriented technologist in the room, and I'm us usually the most technically-oriented business person in the room. And it's that nexus that I have found mm -hmm. is really uh, my, uh, you know, my differentiation. And the last piece of that is the entrepreneurial journey, which has taught me not to take anything for granted. And you know, to, to really push hard to, through the tough times when you have something that you need to get to make happen to go find a way. Amazing. I, I love you know, th this idea of uh, that nexus of, uh, of you know, business-minded, technical, and, uh, and vice versa. I um, want to dive a little bit in and talk a little bit about um, Apple. Um, you know, obviously, you know, an amazing company. Um, how do you see the future of technology evolving, and what role do you believe? At, well, maybe let's take it two parts. How do you see the future of technology evolving in general, and then what role uh, do you think Apple is going to play in the shaping of that future? Well, it's, it's clearly already had a huge impact on things, but I think uh, if you go down to the roots of Apple and what Apple is, uh, it gives you the full answer to the question. Uh, I mean, first off, technology has already permeated our lives. We're now in the second generation of humans that are growing up with uh, technology, you know, as uh, you know, from from birth, and it's changing how we do everything. I mean, we we our experience with memory was forever mm -hmm. altered by Google uh, because mm -hmm. you can always go find a factoid. Uh, our experience with uh, technology was forever altered by the phone because now you always had technology in your pocket. It's changing moving forward with some of the new, uh, you know, with, uh, with the machine learning, AI, generative AI uh, models. Um, and the technology companies that really know how to innovate, I think, are going to be at the center of this. And this is the, the big challenge for t technology companies as they mature is that you uh, sort of lose both the fire and the, the experience when you're the startup of how to push through, to do things differently. Apple is unique because it is a company that has already gone through uh, multiple generations of its existence. You know, there was the initial Apple as a startup and when there were no computers in the world and it created uh, argue, it wasn't the first computer, but it really consumerized the yeah. first consumer in it. It was the first computer I ever used. The first computer I put my fingers on was an Apple II. Uh, you know, then uh, you know, that evolved with, uh, it created essentially the modern user interface with, yeah. uh, with the Macintosh. Uh, you know, fast forward, a company sort of lost its way, just as most technology companies do, and it came very close to not making it. And yet, with Steve Jobs returning and some other uh, really amazing product decisions that, uh, that he helped lead, uh, you know, the company has had uh, a rebirth. And that is not lost on uh, people who are at Apple. I mean, Apple is a company that is, um, for many pe people, uh, this is the only place they, they will work or they want to work because they just love the company so much and the, the company loves them. Uh, and so those at Apple that have been around through all this, um, you know, they don't take for granted uh, th that, you know, just because, you know, you're on top uh, means you're going to be on top tomorrow. There, there can be tough times, and you have to power through it. And this is a company that has gone through that experience uh, and excelled. And then, you know, it also had an amazing, iconic founder. I mean, Steve Jobs was, you know, arguably the Thomas Edison of our day and, you know, was taken from us uh, early, uh, you know, arguably before his, his time. And yet the company found a way to even work through that and has a next generation of leadership. Uh, so I believe that Apple is well suited, not just because it has an important role to play in the development of the next 
set of technologies, not because it has uh, you know the uh, you know the, the the engineering talent and the experience on it, but because it also has gone through uh, this uh, multiple phases of rebirth, mm -hmm. and it's comfortable making those types of generational changes necessary to keep moving forward. Thinking about you know those different points of the evolution, and thinking about this constant like rebirth and, and reimagination. That being said, what, what are some of the challenges that you see, right? If Apple is going to continue to lead, what, as, as you come in as the, the new CIO of Apple, what are those challenges? And then what opportunities does that create for you and, and, and for Apple in general? I mean, it's, it's a very diverse company. There's a lot of different products that uh, Apple is into from, you know, everything from your your computer to your phone, uh, you know, uh, your watch and, and uh, apparels, AirPods, Apple TV, Apple TV Plus, content, all this stuff. So it's an extremely diverse business. So I would say for, um, you know, part of the challenge that the company has is just continuing to operate at scale. Mm. And part of the challenge that my organization has is innovating uh, at scale. You know, when you get to be uh, large, certain things become much more difficult. If we're going to, you know, just keep our SAP environment up to date, that's no longer a simple process. It's not like you just push a button and then wake up the next morning and the system is upgraded. And if we're going to, uh, you know, transform our, our workforce management uh, practices, you know, that's not as simple as just deciding, oh, we're going to implement this system and we'll get it done next week. Um, so we have a lot more to think about as a company and as an organization to innovate and, and to operate at scale. But at the same time, you know, that's also the opportunity, is that we can work very closely with the different vendors that are a big part of our ecosystem uh, to get, uh, to help them figure out new ways to drive their products in new directions yeah. and to meet new levels of scale that are necessary for us to operate with their products. And, you know, we like to do so in a way that is, you know, mutually beneficial. This is, you know, we're, we're uh, we benefit from the partnerships that we that we have with uh, companies, and for those things that we can't, we'll just go build them those those uh, things ourselves. Um, so it is an incredibly diverse set of challenges. It is an incredibly broad set of challenges. For me, I think I have re I realized that I have technology ADD. I don't mm. like to do just one thing. I need to have 15 <laughs> different things to deal with in a single morning and. Thankfully, Apple offers me that challenge. I get to deal with a whole different set of challenges every single day, and I love it, and I have a fantastic team to support me in it, and it's just this amazing combination of you know, deep expertise, um, you know, breadth of experience, uh, the history with the company, and with my background, you know, the uh, experience that I've had working uh, at other similar organizations yeah. that, that may have some things to offer Apple, and then some of the things that I've just learned along the way myself. I see some people in the audience from SAP raising their hands saying <laughs> we can help. Um, let's let, let's stay on that on, on that idea right now about you know your role, right, and and how. Um, how do you see your role as CIO in, in regards to shaping and enhancing the experience of Apple customers? Again, there's a, there's a broad different uh, way that, that we provide that, starting with the workforce. You know, our, our job is to support the, the company. And we have some of the most amazing engineers in the world, some of the most iconic people in the world. And uh, you know, we're providing everything for them from you know, the wireless systems to the information systems necessary. But um, you know, the organization that I'm responsible for does a lot of things to help just make the product operate. You know, when you log into your Apple device, you're logging into a service that my team delivers. When your phone, you're checking the time on the phone, you're basically using an NTP service that my team delivers. When you go to the store, you know, whether it's a retail store, you go online, that's a lot of technology that my organization is responsible for uh, delivering. So we have the opportunity to directly affect uh, the consumer experience on everything from you know, how you learn about Apple, particularly in new parts of the world that are just now starting to uh, 
emerge as markets for the company to how you experience the products, whether you are uh, you know, a new customer or an existing customer just coming in to learn about uh, new features for, for, for new products maybe that you're not using yet or um, for a product that you want to upgrade. Uh, to the entire experience of making sure that you can get that device. You know, when we roll out products, it's not like you have to wait six months before you, millions of people can get them. They're available almost right away, and that is uh, an incredibly complex uh, set of uh, operational and technical uh, systems that enable uh, yeah. us to deliver products globally and the period of time that it takes from when we announce them to when you can buy yeah. them. Uh, so there's just a ton of things that we do on that front, and you know what, we're always pushing for more. How do we drive more scale out of that store? How do we further uh, make it so that you know when you want to buy a, a watch, you can buy the exact configuration uh, that you want? How do we make it so that you better understand uh, the features of the product when you're not able to go into an Apple store because you're in a country where you're, you're going to experience the products for the first time in a partner store? Yeah. How do we help our partners um, better communicate and, and converse with customers about our products. These are all different ways that we influence the experience of our customers, and it's one of the most amazing opportunities yeah. I've ever had in my That's life. That's amazing. That's amazing. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I want to switch gears a little bit um, and talk about um, kind of one of the hotter topics right now. I think the chief economist was chatting about it, and they asked his opinion on you know, sort of AI and, and, and all these different tools that are, that, are have, that are out. In fact, we have a session later this afternoon about how generative AI is disrupting the future of technology. I'm curious to hear your thoughts specifically on how generative AI could, more on the employment side, how it could create new jobs in the tech industry, or do you think it could create new jobs in the tech industry, and how generative AI could change the skills and qualifications that are in demand today in the tech industry? I don't think it's a could on either, it's, a, it's going to. Okay. Um, you know, I think we are facing a new uh, inflection point of technology, and we've already seen a couple. That's what's amazing, and you, know, you go back to uh, the history of uh, humankind, you know, the, a major inflection point took place when we invented the printing press and all of a sudden information could be easily propagated where prior to that it had to be handed down uh, you know, word of mouth and uh, a book was a very expensive thing to, to write. Uh, you know, fast forward 500 years and you get uh, to uh, you know, the internet and how information at our fingertips really transforms things and then as I said earlier with the, uh, with the phone, uh, you know, being able to bring that wherever you are, um, these are all major inflection points that we've experienced, and I think we are now starting to see a new one with the whole generative AI uh, technology. Now, at, uh, given the, despite the, the hype on this, I also think we get a little bit ahead of ourselves. You go back to the internet, you know, when the internet came out, uh, you know, when it became popular, it didn't come out, but when the internet became popular in 1995, there was lots and lots of predictions about what you would be able to do and how this would transform every aspect of business. Those predictions were correct. The time horizons were not. Uh, in some cases, it took 20 years for banking to fully move online or for video distribution to become commonplace um, through, the, uh, through the internet. And in the meantime, there you know, were lots of uh, predictions that in the short term failed to come to pass. Um, There's also a lot of you know, fear, uncertainty, and doubt thrown around about how this was going to uh, destroy a lot of jobs, and in some respects, I suppose you could look at it from that perspective, but in an aggregate, what it really did is change society yeah. and create a lot more opportunity. And what AI is doing uh, today, and uh, it, again, it's, it's not like we just invented these technologies six months ago. These are things that have been under development for decades. It's just they have hit an inflection point where they are now more usable. Right. Um, it is starting to change what the rest of us um, are expected to do. You look at generative AI, large language models, and uh, you know it's a big challenge now for teachers yeah. that they can't uh, just expect that because they have a cohesive sentence or paragraph or paper that was turned in by a student that it was now authored by right. that student. 
but to some degree, um, you know, what, is, what really needs to change is what exactly are we teaching? Uh, you know, the generative AI stuff doesn't, it's not like it is uh, changing, it's not, it doesn't have a soul, it's not coming up with new ideas, it's just regurgitating stuff that's yeah. already there. Some stuff which is wrong, right. some stuff uh, which it can be confidently wrong <laughs> on. So, you know, the analytical skills of the human is, are, is necessary in order to, to take advantage of that um, and to really uh, make use of the information in, in the right way. And, uh, and I think that's, uh, that's just looking at the consumption of this technology and the production of the technology in order to produce the training data necessary for these models to work is a lot of manipulation of that data. And that's something which requires both uh, semi-skilled and highly skilled resources to do. And so there is just gonna be an incredible amount of demand right there. These language models, this generative AI stuff is extremely computationally yeah. uh, uh, expensive. And so that's gonna create new uh, demands on uh, infrastructure resources to go find new ways to optimize this stuff. It's gonna create new demand for new software algorithms to try to optimize things. Uh, so I don't think that this is a, we face a world where you know, AI is taking over. Instead, quite the opposite. I think that we find new opportunities and it will just continue to accelerate the improvement in our lives. Uh, and then the, the last thing I would say is that if, when you look at what computers are good at and what humans are good at, they're very, very different things. And this is the, the reason why I don't get scared by this stuff. You know, the, the machine is really, really good at doing the repetitive stuff that is you know, kind of boring, you know, so, yeah. Uh, whereas the human is very good at the ambiguous stuff, you know, when you fly in an airplane, like, you know, you can get the autopilot to keep the plane going, but when two, uh, you lose both your engines and you gotta land the thing in New York City without killing a bunch of people right. on the plane, you need a human being to go figure out what to do in an extremely short period of time. That is a very ambiguous situation. And so the jobs of the future are going to benefit from those of us who are really good at interpreting ambiguity and using the automation that technology is gonna offer us to be able to do more. And that is actually a very optimistic view of the future. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. And talk about being convincingly wrong. I recently asked one of the tools, I won't name which one it was, to write a bio for me. Um, and it gave me a very impressive, very convincing bio that had me doing a bunch of things that I had never done. <laughs> well, congratulations. I was like, oh, this is pretty great. <laughs> Maybe it was writing your future bio. A Maybe. doctorate degree from you know, some university in Texas. It was, it was fantastic. I, I want to meet this I guy. I see a doctorate degree in your future. <laughs> um, talking again um, a little bit about um, talent in the workforce and, and specifically shifting to something that is very near and dear to all of us here at, at high tech, um, which is diversity and inclusion. Uh, it's become, you know, as we know, in incredibly important to consumers as well, not just the, the business imperative, but consumers are now asking. Um, how is Apple working to ensure that its products and services are designed to meet the needs of diverse communities? And what steps are you taking to promote diversity and inclusion within Apple's workforce? Yeah, this is one of the things I, I love about Apple. It's really easy for me to, uh, I, 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 when I was interviewing with the company, I really fell in love with the values uh, of the organization. This is one of them. Uh, Apple is building products for the world, for everyone. And uh, so, uh, you know, and part of it, you know, it, it takes advantage of the way that it's designed the technology. You know, the, the iPhone uh, you know, can just as easily display a, a katakana keyboard as it can display a, mm -hmm. a, a, a Roman numeral keyboard. And, um, the, uh, you know, so the, the product is able to adapt, but the company really cares about its customers and its consumers, and it spends a lot of time you know, uh, listening and, and, and looking at how uh, its product is, is being utilized so that it, we can better uh, tailor the product to different cultures. And the results are kind of amazing. I mean, when you see um, the enthusiasm about uh, the, the, the company and the products when Apple opens new stores as we just recently did in India. There's just so much energy and it's been uh, really incredible to me to go learn about our performance in different countries and how 
consumers in all of these different locales, whether they're in China or Latin America, um, really uh, aspire to own Apple products. And the more that we can help make those products affordable for them and valuable for them, uh, then they reward us by, uh, by buying those products. And uh, so the company takes this very seriously. I think there's a, uh, just an, an, a number of things that are inherent in the, uh, the way the products operate, but it's also a very global company. Mm -hmm. Apple is not just in the US. My organization is not just in the US. You know, I have uh, teams that are in Europe, in Asia, in India. Uh, the company has presence all over the world, and, uh, and we use that presence to learn and to make sure that what we're building uh, for people is our, our products that people will love worldwide. Yeah. You talked about, um, you gave an example of a, how a pilot can't necessarily be replaced <laughs> by a machine. Uh, you recently got your pilot's license. Yeah. Congratulations. Um, I, talk to us about you know, why you set out to start flying and, and how this experience has, has changed you and, and helped you grow as a leader. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a little bit of... Um, In all the spare time that you have, it's, obviously. It's yeah. tied to how, how I grew up. You know, so when I, when I was a kid, um, you know, my, my, my dad uh, brought home a computer when I was really young, and, and like everything else, I'd take it apart and horrified him in that, in that process. But uh, the, uh, one of the things that, uh, I, mean, I was actually quite disappointed that the first computer my dad brought home was an IBM PC. Because hmm. uh, all my friends had apples, and I, I want to play Space Invaders on them. I had a Tandy 1000 from Radio Shack. <laughs> well, the, uh, one of the first uh, video games available on the IBM PC was Microsoft Flight Simulator. Remember and that. so um, that was just a game that I learned to play. And I fell in love with aviation at that point. And I, I literally, I had airplanes all over the place. And ever since I was a kid, and lots of plane posters on the wall, uh, the Spruce Goose, uh, uh, Constellation, just all these, all these uh, things. And that was what I wanted to do. Um, you know, my, my inspiration as a kid, I wanted to be a pilot. And, uh, you know, a couple weird things happened along the way. Uh, we ended the Cold War, which was a good thing, uh, but it meant that when I graduated from college, the uh, pilot slots were a little bit less uh, available. Um, I ended up marrying my high school sweetheart, and uh, she and I, you know, as we were thinking about, you know, what a professional life would be with her as a military wife, it was maybe not the best for her, uh, exciting for me, but maybe not the best for her. And so I decided to put it aside. And, um, and it's just one of these life goals that's always been in the back of my head that um, I kept put, putting off. And I'd focus on my career. I kept telling myself, I'll do it with my, in my spare time. And I'd never create the spare time for it. As time went on, um, you know, I got older and older and older, and I started to th realize that at some point, I'm never going to be able to do this if I don't make this a priority. And it was around the time that I was selling Woven that I decided I needed to make this, I, if I was gonna do this, I needed to do this now. And I needed a break anyways. The startup was uh, quite a, a beating on my body and I needed an opportunity to do something for myself. So I decided to go back uh, and get my pilot's license. And that's uh, essentially what I did. So I sold Woven and three weeks later, I started flight training and in eight months I did roughly what most people do in three to five years uh, for their pilot's wow. license. So I got several hundred hours of experience. I uh, got my instrument rating and uh, just had an, a tremendous uh, experience with it. And I can't tell you the day that I first soloed, all I could think about was that little kid that had that dream of becoming a pilot. And it was like a very emotional moment for me. I really, it was this culmination of a life goal. And I think if there's one thing that I would wanna like, um, share with everybody about this is not to lose those things because they make us human. They make us who we are. And sometimes it's easy to forget them because of family and other stuff, but uh, it felt so incredible to achieve that life goal for myself. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I remember you saying that you learned as you were flying over middle America somewhere, um, you learned that something was happening back home. Yeah. Um, if you don't mind getting a little personal, um, yeah. you know, we're, we're coming on almost a year since uh, your home was destroyed in a massive fire. 
uh, and yeah. when we spoke last week, you, you talked about the, the, the challenge of this and, and your family and everything that you guys have faced um, and how this kind of helped shape your perspective on a lot of things. Can, can you talk to us what, you know, what happened and, and just share with us this Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to do it without getting emotional. Um, but uh, let's just start with 2022. I thought 2020 was a screwed up year. <laughs> 2022 was just like, okay, that was the warm up and now we're gonna put you through some things and we're gonna see how you do. Um, and that was basically what, what my higher power decided for me. Um, so, you know, the first high was getting the pilot's license and my instrumenting and all that. And it was also a low because, and I was like, you know, I wanna go do something. I need to, I, I was sad when I achieved the goal because I, I it was the journey yeah. that was, meant a lot. Um, there was a high in that, you know, I had decided to build, the, do this trip with my family where we we're gonna fly together in a small airplane uh, from one side of the country to another. And we, we kind of joked, we were like the Griswolds, right? You know, from <laughs> vacation. And if you haven't seen that movie, it's like a series of disasters that just happen to them as they're trying to go to Wally World. And, um, you know, it, sure enough, it started with us. When we picked up the airplane, a series of disasters happened, and we had a little problem with the plane, and we couldn't take off, and we had to go deal with that. And, but we got there, and we went to St. Louis, and we had a great time. But on the second day, we were flying from Kansas City back to um, Colorado Springs, and we are going to go to the Air Force Academy. And, let my son see what that place is like. And uh, I got a text message, and it was, there's smoke in Andrew's room. Uh, this was from uh, you know, our, our little nest fire alarm thing. And I'd never gotten this alert before, so I figured something was wrong with it. Um, our dogs were in the house. Um, our daughter's friend was in the house. And so you know, we, we figured it was a false alarm. We started texting her. Um, but we're in the air. We can't call, can't yeah. stop, can't pull over. Yeah. Um, and we started to get more and more information over the next few minutes from our, our friends, uh, from our neighbors, the house was on fire. And um, it just got worse, worse and worse and worse. As more information came through, it was clear it was a big fire. Um, the fire department uh, was struggling to put out the house. We were in a place it's kind of hard for them to get the trucks up to. And mm -hmm. anyways, um, you know, it was kind of panic, and my, my kids were freaking out about the dogs. We didn't know if the dogs were okay. Yeah. We didn't know if our daughter's friend was okay. We didn't know what was going on, and uh, my job was to fly this stupid plane. You know, it was like, what? We, we need to get down on the ground. Um, in fact, I, I made a mistake. Um, you know, when you're flying, you have air traffic control talking to you left and right, and they're like, you know, they're just checking in on you every few minutes to make sure that, you know, everything's okay, and they've been checking in on me, and I wasn't responding, so they were starting to get a little irritated with me, uh, and so they're like, hey, 997 Tango Charlie, are you there? Do you read? And I'm like, oh, yeah, 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 sorry, we're just having a small emergency up here, which is the exact wrong thing you want to say <laughs> to air traffic control, because then they start, you know, you know, <laughs> scrambling the F-16s, <laughs> clear the airfield, get the fire department out, all this kind of stuff. So I had to calm them down. No, 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 but I do need to land. I need to get on the ground, and we did. And we just got all the details of what was going on. The amazing thing was the dogs were okay, and our daughter's friend was okay. Um, but when we got home, we saw we lost everything. Everything. Like, we lost clothes, photos, everything. Um, all my high-tech awards. <laughs> we'll, get the, we'll get those replaced for you. <laughs> They're all gone. <laughs> They're all gone. Um, and, uh, but you know, there were a couple little things um, to be grateful for. Um, in my house, in uh, the closet behind our bedroom, that was the, the place that took the worst heat from the fire. Um, it was all of our stuff, my wife's wedding dress and our photos and all that, and it was all destroyed. Um, but I was able, as I was scrounging through there, to find this one thing. It was covered in goo. It was a whole bunch of, a plastic box had melted over it and, and protected it, and it was our wedding album. Mm. And it was, 
pristine on the inside, singed on the outside, but pristine on the inside. And we got married at a time where there are no digital records right. of our photos, so this was it. Um, and so, you know, it was this thing to be grateful for. And that's kind of how the next few months ended up being for us is, um, at first I was angry, at first I was really frustrated and really, um, you know, it was, it was hard to accept. I, I wanted to get mad at the universe for having this happen to us. Everybody kept saying, you know, oh, at least your dogs were okay, at least your daughter's friend was okay. And I was get annoyed with them, that, like they were just trying to say that to be nice until it hit me that that was the message. It was the gratitude, you know. I was with my family. We were okay. You know, I was with my kids. We experienced it together. Um, you know, and it's not, it's not fun to lose all your stuff. You know, no matter, it is stuff, yep. but you know, these are also your memories. It's not fun to lose that stuff, but we did it together as a family. And I learned at that moment just to be grateful, you know? I, I woke up the next day, my wife was there. I love my wife, you know, my, my kids. You know, we still got to, to spend time together to go hiking and do stuff and, you know, I, I, my silly annoying dogs still <laughs> stick their noses in my face. Uh, you know, there were so many things to be grateful for and that is my life today. You know, I, I don't take anything for granted. And I, I try, no matter how frustrating and difficult things get, to put stuff in perspective. Yeah, it sucks when things don't go my way. But, you know, I'll just take it one day at a time and just love the world for what it is. Yeah. And here's the amazing thing about my fire. I was going to take a job at a company. I was supposed to tell them that week that whether I was going to go forward with this job. And I, I, I liked the company. It was in aviation. You know, it was a, it was a good job, but it, something about it didn't feel right for me. And my house burns down, and so I got totally distracted. Sure. And I just couldn't, I couldn't tell them yes. I couldn't tell them anything. I'm just like, guys, I need, I'm going to need weeks. If you got to move on, you got to move on. But I had started interviewing at Apple in mm -hmm. April. My house burned down on Father's Day. Apple was behind these, this other company. It was kind of too far for me to wait for because they needed more time to kind of figure everything out. We were only a couple of interviews in by this point. But my house burned down. It created that time. And then, um, you know, things just kept going. And I got to tell you, man, Apple was so amazing to me. You know, I, I called them up. I was like, yeah, I, I have an interview with the CFO tomorrow. I don't know if I can come. And they're like, why? What's wrong? I was like, my house burned down. I don't have any clothes. <laughs> 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 and they were like, you know what? Don't worry about it. If you got to show up in shorts and a t-shirt, the rest of us will too. It's all fine. It's all good. And you know, I, I didn't think Apple was as people-oriented of a company as it showed me mm -hmm. in those moments. I was, and it was really caring towards me. But also, my tragedy created the space for Apple to catch up, and here I am. Yeah. And I never could have predicted that. And so that's why I say 2022 for me, it, it wasn't even, I won't even call it a terrible year. It was just a dynamic one. It yeah. was just crazy. It was the world, you know, it was, my higher power really just throwing me through the gauntlet and seeing what happens. Do I become a tyrannical jerk? Am I mean to my family? Do I kick my dog? Or do I just love the world for what it is and show up and just do the best that I can and be grateful for what I have? And that's, you know, that's what I was, yeah. was inspired to do. And yeah. that's who I am today. You're rebuilding your house now. Yes, now. Uh, <laughs> That's a whole nother. My, my, uh, the challenges, uh, the state of California does not make it easy to build a house. <laughs> it's, it's a very, very time consuming process and you know, keep getting told what I can't put into my house anymore uh, because of one thing or another. It's, uh, it's, it's an exercise in patience. It's also an exercise in people. 
you know, at the end of the day, you know, as, as much as I want to complain about my city, when I go down there and I talk to them, they're people. They know who I am. They, they know my house burned down. They, they care for me. And when they need to go do something, you know, there's only, in my city, there's only been two fires in the last 10 years. Mm. Um, so that, that's great, and I'm happy that that's the case. But it also means they don't know how to deal with me. Yeah. So they treat me like anybody else who's trying to remodel their house, and, and that's a time-consuming process. I'm just trying to get home. Yeah. You know? I just, I just, I just want to have a house. <laughs> so when, uh, when you talk with people, they treat you like people, and I, I respect and appreciate that. And it's it's another big part of life, you know. At the end of the day, you know, we're we're not Apple or Facebook or Woven or Google or whatever. You know, we're just a bunch of people, and it's just uh, and that's part of today. You yeah. know, for me, walking in the door yeah. and seeing everybody, some people I haven't seen in a couple yeah. years, I felt like I was home. You know, I, love I, it. I felt like I was with my family. The warm hugs that I received, it just feels good. And that is, I think, if there's one thing for us, it's, it's this community, it's to give to each other that. It's yeah. family and yeah. love. Well, you are with your family, and it's great I to have it. you. We have a couple more minutes, and I have two more questions for you. This one, hopefully, is fun. <laughs> What's your favorite tech gadget and why? Oh. <laughs> I gotta tell you, I'm falling in love with this thing. Is that right? This is my last Apple product that I, I had bought, the, the Apple Watch. Yeah, at our company, this also serves as my badge, so I can just stick nice. my watch by the badge reader and it lets me in. It uh, you know, reminds me to uh, you know, do my, my, my gratefuls and uh, that kind of stuff. It keeps me healthy, tells me if my heart's beating right. And, all that good stuff. Even when I'm flying and I'm up at altitude, this thing will tell me if my blood oxygen level is hmm. uh, below threshold or I need to use oxygen. It's, hmm. it's amazing. I love this, this product. It's awesome. Love it. Love it. Um, I feel like you've shared so much about this already, um, but I'm going to ask you for some final words of wisdom for the high tech community. Well, uh, it starts with love. You know, just, just love. love. Love your job, love your life. Uh, you know, it's so easy to get angry for all the things that aren't perfect in the world, and I get it. And I'm, I'm not by no means, uh, you know, trying to dismiss those issues. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, that's 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 it pales in comparison to the amazing aspects of what's around us. The second is, you know, you know love each other and and give to each other and leverage community. I think that yeah. for me, my success has been so much a function of others that I have had the opportunity to, to meet and work with and get to know. Um, you know, whether it's you know, Ramon Baez, who's been an amazing uh, mentor, Jorge Tittinger, who's like, uh, you know, the, he's the one who, who got me my first CIO gig. Um, if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be sitting here today. Um, the, uh, it is so much we have to offer each other, and it's what makes an organization like High Tech so important is that together we can do so much more than we can individually. Love it. Speaking of working together, how do we work together to host one of these at Apple in the I future? I know. We'll have to <laughs> work with my team. I mean, we did a great job a few years ago, so I'd love to have the opportunity to do it again. And well, we let's make it happen. Right. Tim, thank you so, so much. Right. Thank you.